Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is my colleague, Vernon Smith, professor of economics and law at George Mason University and the 2002 Nobel Laureate in Economics. Vernon, welcome to EconTalk. Uh, thanks, Ross. I'm very happy to be here. Vernon, you've been a pioneer in what has come to be called experimental economics. I'm sure many of our listeners wonder what an economics experiment could possibly be. Can you tell us why you started doing experiments and how they actually work, what what they're about? Uh, Well, I went to uh, Purdue University as a young assistant professor in 1955, started teaching principles of economics. And uh, I found out uh, something pretty important, and that is that I really didn't know what the connection was between what people actually do in markets under various uh, uh, trading rules and the theory of supply and demand that we taught. And uh, I had read all the pretty books, had a PhD from Harvard, and I found out that I really didn't know anything about that. The uh, conventional stories that we told were two. Uh, one of the stories was that if a market gets to something that we call a supply and demand equilibrium, it's because everybody in the market has complete and perfect information on the conditions of supply and demand. Well, that never inspired confidence in me as a uh, as any very um, um, Indication as any very believable indication that supply and demand uh, was relevant to what we observed. Uh, the other story we told was that you had to have very large numbers of buyers and sellers, and they all had to be price takers, be small enough in the market that they took prices given. Uh, well, the they, problem they with couldn't. that argument is that if, if everyone is a price taker, who makes the price? <laughs> right. So uh, these were not very satisfactory uh, stories. And also, it was all about equilibrium. It kind of wasn't about how people might discover whatever an equilibrium was. And so that's what launched me into, uh, in January 1956, to uh, doing my first, uh, and it was a classroom experiment. And so I made half of them buyers and half of them sellers, and I gave the buyers private secret values and the sellers private secret costs known only by those individuals. And those values... Any set of values, arbitrary set of them, if you array them from highest to lowest, define what in economics we would call a, a demand schedule. By value, it would be the, the amount they would get to enjoy minus the price they ended up paying. Right. You can think of that as a max, their maximum willingness to pay for a, a unit of some commodity. And, of course... Uh, buyers profit from exchange because they usually buy at much lower prices than the most they're willing to pay. And the neat thing about experiments is that it does show that buyers profit from exchange just as much as sellers, although we normally think of sellers only as profiting because that's the way we think of accounting as working. But anyway, I gave the the buyers, the people who are going to be buyers, these values, the people who would be sellers, uh, costs, unit costs. And those costs arrayed from lowest to highest for the supply schedule. 
So this is a really very simple market. Uh, the thing that's made it interesting is that no one knew what the supply and demand was. Each person only had a little fragment of that total. And nevertheless, though, these people did get information back from the market because I organized it as a, as a two-sided auction. Buyers would announce oral bids. Sellers would announce asking prices. Uh, and if a seller accepted some uh, the, the uh, bid price of some buyer, that was a contract. And if a buyer accepted the asking price of some seller, that was a contract. So it's just sort of a two-sided version of an ordinary country uh, auction, as we used to call them. And so then, and then I repeated this experiment in a series of trading days. And each trading day was only a few minutes long. Well, this market converged to the uh, price and volume, approximately, that's represented by the intersection of those supply and demand schedules. To your surprise, I assume. This is kind of some kind of magic by the uh, conventional wisdom of the day. These, these people, it was the first, I did it, the first day of class, uh, in January 1956, because I didn't want them to be contaminated by any any reading, right. any economic. Sure. And they did the first day, so so these are just naive uh, people. They don't know anything about supply and demand. They don't know anything about economics. Uh, the buyers, however, were motivated to buy low. The sellers motivated to sell high. They were on their own in terms of of uh, their bidding and asking behavior. And so after three or four periods, this converged to the competitive equilibrium, or very close to it. There was some noise in there. but it, And then, yeah, this seemed like uh, 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 magic. So, But what it was showing, of course, is that people actually are quite good in a situation where they have, have an opportunity to do repeat trading and learning, they're actually quite good at discovering uh, prices and quantities that clear a market. Even though that's not their goal. They don't have any – their goal is just their individual in, incentive to get the maximum price if they're a seller or a, minim, a low price if they're a buyer. Yes, and it's kind of even worse than that, Russ, in the sense that if after one of these experiments, and you understand then I got hooked on it, and I started to do a lot of them. Sure. Uh, if after one of these experiments, you ask people if there's, they think there's any kind of a model, a quantitative or mathematical model that could explain where they ended up, there's widespread denial that that could be the case. Well, but you all you have to do is in advance uh, have a sealed envelope. You put the equilibrium price and quantity in it and give it to one of the subjects, one of the people in the classroom if you're teaching. <coughs> and then they can open it afterwards and they can see how, uh, how remarkably accurate they were. And an another thing that they don't uh, perceive is if you ask them, well, after this market settled down, do you think you were making as much money as you possibly could? Well, almost everyone believes that surely they could have done better. Well, but they can't, and it's by definition of an equilibrium. The equilibrium has the property that each person is doing the very best he can to, for himself, given what everybody else is doing, given the behavior of others. And that's what John Nash uh, uh meant by an equilibrium. So they don't have they don't have the perception that of gains from trade and the welfare maximizing benefits of what they're doing and neither do they have this understanding that they're actually uh, doing very well for themselves 
in that environment. And isn't it also the case that it satisfies Alfred Marshall's insights into that equilibrium, which is the the total gains to the buyers and sellers combined is maximized. There's no foregone benefits to the group as a whole, which is rather exactly. which is rather shocking. Yes, it is. The, the, the surplus, as we would call it, the buyers plus sellers surplus, is uh, is maximized. Now. Of course, it took me a, a few years after 1955 be, before I uh, fully accepted this. I did more experiments, and the idea, I had the idea, well, maybe it's an accident of the first, the way I designed the supply and demand. Well, I, I, I varied that tremendously, and I varied the number of participants. Of course, I started out with pretty large numbers, 25 to maybe 50 thinking that that was important. Turns out that's not important at all. It turns out if you've got, oh, four to six people, uh, more or less balanced on both sides of the market, it may be a somewhat noisy and, and, and volatile uh, a pattern of convergence, but these markets still converge. So it's not, I, I would never tell, make the claim that what's important about a competitive market is having large numbers. What I what's beautiful about it, among many things, is the still to this day, textbooks and teachers say that to have competition for supply and demand to be relevant, you have to have an infinite number of suppliers or an, perfect information. All these assumptions that don't hold in the real world, and I think discourage our students from understanding market forces. The other thing that I think I found beautiful in watching, I once I saw a former student of yours, uh, Don Corsi, run one of these for participants. And one of the things that was so fascinating is that we have in our mind this idealized idea that buyers compete with sellers in trying to negotiate a good price. But when you're in one of these, you find out that your main competition's from your fellows. So if you're a seller, it's your other sellers who are ruining it for you by bidding prices down. And in the case of the buyers, it's the other buyers competing with you to get access to the goods and bidding prices up. So in those small experiments of four to six people, what you're saying, I think, is that even in those, it's very hard for, say, suppliers to collude and uh, exploit consumers. There's still competition. Uh, that's right. And there's sort of no shortage of attempts to do that. And, and of course, <clears throat> Also, what's interesting uh, is not only that uh, sellers will undercut each other, but if some are trying to hold the price up, uh, the buyers will, will withhold <laughs> mm -hmm. from those uh, sellers and and bid lower and try to encourage other sellers to accept. So you get you, you get that from both from both sides, and of course now. Uh, one of the questions that arose early, too, was how these markets, how sensitive are they to the uh, trading rules? The, the, see, this is a two-sided auction. Well, uh, I and my colleagues went on and studied posted offer markets where sellers are posting take-or-leave-it prices each period, and buyers are just picking off uh, the low price sellers. And the, what we find is those markets have more inertia. They don't adjust as rapidly as a two-sided auction. So the convergence is somewhat slower, but they still get there. Sellers end up, um, they, they tend to start high above the competitive equilibrium and converge then to the south. Uh, toward the competitive equilibrium, and it takes longer. Instead of three or four periods, it maybe takes 10 or uh, ten or 11, depending upon. It is uh, influenced by the, uh, by the shapes of the supply and demand schedules, but that's a pretty uh, uh, general finding, I believe. Now, I might also mention that, you see, 20 years later, my first paper was published 
1962, and I uh, published the results of the of of a uh, dozen or so experiments that I'd done over the years. This is six years after you'd actually done them. Yes. And I know I know you've uh, written that that first paper. Um, it was it wasn't well received by the uh, journal that you sent it to. Uh, that's that's correct. It was rejected. Yeah, not, not at first. The uh, I submitted that paper probably about 1960 to the Journal of Political Economy. And now, why did I send it to the uh, JPE? Well, that's the University of Chicago Journal. And I thought, well, now what have I shown? I've shown that markets really work quite well and better than I anticipated and better than kind of the conventional wisdom of uh, as we taught it in economics. So I said, I'll send it to the uh, JPE because those guys in Chicago have a reputation for believing in markets. So they'll like this. Well, that was wrong. <laughs> and I think it's, it became evident why it's wrong. Uh, you know, if you believe in markets... <laughs> You don't necessarily need evidence. Oh, that's right. That's true of many areas of our field, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, and so that's when I sort of uh, discovered uh, oh, kind of a, an ideological point of view that I think I've I managed to chip away that uh, on that and and change it. George Stigler at the University of Chicago eventually became a, a, a great fan of experimental economics, and so did others. But it, but it took a little bit of uh, ice-breaking at the time, and actually that paper would not have been published in the JPE if it hadn't been for uh, Harry Johnson, who was, took over as the new editor. When I submitted it, it was a different editor. And it got turned down by two referees. And uh, I just didn't accept that. I, uh, By that time, I had done some more experiments and wanted to revise the paper anyway. So I sent it back with a rebuttal to the, the two referees. And it had a new editor now. The new editor sent it to two more referees. <laughs> they were also negative. <laughs> and... But the new editor said that he wanted me to uh, he wanted me to consider all of the comments and and see if I agreed, see if I wanted to do any more to the paper, and and he'd like to have it again. Now this is very unusual for an editor, of course. And I did that, sent it back, and he accepted it, and it's pretty remarkable. In his letter of acceptance, uh, he said, you know, he said, I haven't been at this job very long, and and I've learned a lot. He says, I've discovered that you have to keep evaluating everybody, including yourself. He says, I have to confess that I was one of the original referees that was negative on the paper. But he says, you've convinced me. That is so, that is awesome. That is, that's it great, is awesome, man. Of course, great story. if you only get one person to convince Russ, you want it to be the editor, yeah, right? You, yeah, you got lucky there. But uh, <laughs> usually, they're a little more uh, stubborn about uh, things they don't initially agree with. So I think that's a um, it's an uplifting story. <laughs> well, and also, uh, I got to know Harry Johnson a little bit, not really well. But and, and more about his work. And, you know, Harry Johnson was the last editor of the JPE who read everything that came in, every single paper. And I would say he's probably the last editor of, J, of the JPE who was competent to read every paper that came in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was uh, technically competent. He was very broad-based and uh, wide-ranging. And, uh, and that's an example, I think, of the... Uh, of the sort of independence that he he brought to the uh, that that job and that task. So I should also mention that, of course, that, that this is really quite a simple market. Uh, 
it's an isolated market, and we know that things are much more, or have good reason to believe that things are much more interdependent than is represented. It's a stylized situation of trying to capture enough of reality. Yes, but we, and by the early 80s, we were starting to do uh, experiments in which the subjects interacted through the terminals of computers. And so things like a bid-ask market or a posted offer market, those rules for trading, we could now program into the computer, and they governed... Uh, the messages that the uh, buyers and sellers would would exchange among themselves. And so now it became possible to do much more complex uh, experiments in particular. And we did uh, the first one of these we, we would have, I would guess, run about 1982. And in this market, the, the the amount you a buyer was willing to pay, say for a unit of commodity A, depended upon the price of B, and vice versa. In other words, uh, people's willingness to pay for either commodity was not independent of, of what was happening in the market for the other commodity. So they had a much more complex, simultaneous. Uh, equation problem uh, to solve. Although, of course, you understand they don't understand it. the people who are in the experiment don't understand anything about simultaneous equations. But what's interesting is that the double auction trading solves that problem also. And in, in about seven or eight trading periods. Uh, a two commodity market will converge to the equilibrium price and, and volume in each of those markets. That is the price that where supply and demand cross for each one. Yes. Except now, as I say, it's more complex and if you write the equations out for this, you're talking about solving four nonlinear equations in two prices and two quantities. Nobody in this of these subjects would have any idea how to do that. Okay, and as, that's as not a mathematical it, exercise, but, you know, they don't have to know how to do it. That's not what they're trying to do. No, that's not what they're trying to do. They're just trying to do well for themselves. And if they make bad trades, they tend to remember those and correct them later. And then so they they just gradually, over time, discover these, these uh, prices and exchange volumes. And the... They no longer can now improve their own situations, so they tend to settle into an equilibrium, and that equilibrium is is an optimal one. So it's pretty remarkable. And as you said a little while ago, we have people st out there still teaching what I learned 50 years ago. Yeah, and, and you've... it's unfortunately it's wrong. You've been uh, uncovering the outlines of the invisible hand, sort of uh, scraping away the the dust and the sand to see that there's something uh, that appears to be magical, uh, but in fact is evidently something deep about the world around us. You know, it's uh, pretty – I've taken on a tremendous respect for the ability of – human beings to solve problems through the institutions that they have somehow <laughs> created. And these institutions, of course, we don't really know a lot about where they come from. If you think of auctions, you know, one, the so-called English auction actually goes back to the, to the Babylonians, 500 B.C., and that is, a say, a buyer's a bid auction where units, a fixed quantity is put up for sale. And it's pretty clear that somehow the double auction evolved out of that. But that history, uh, you see, is, is lost. And another thing that's, that's lost is all the things that people tried that didn't work. <laughs> sure, all the failures. Yeah, all the failures. And yet, 
those are very important, the failures. Uh, but, but you see, people don't write. Uh, they don't uh, record very much about the things that didn't work. In fact, they don't like to even admit that they tried things that didn't work. Sure. And, and yet, it's part of the learning, and somehow... Uh, in the human career, we have devised these these uh, traditions that retain uh, certain patterns of behavior and certain rules. And and what I think the experiments show is how well those rules have served us as just enormously valuable uh, means of facilitating uh, wealth creation. Which rules do you mean? Oh, the uh, trading rules in markets. And uh, it's, uh, and of course, underneath all of this, these exchange systems, uh, is where you find the kind of specialization that exchange makes possible. Now, of course, Adam Smith wrote very eloquently on, you know, his basic theorem was that the division of labor is determined by the extent of the market. And and the idea is that people can't find specialties that that take advantage of their own unique characteristics unless there there's a means whereby what they earn in that specialty can be used to buy the products of others. This, of course, is a basic story we t- we tell in in economics. But I think we we really understand very little about how it is that specialization and exchange systems evolve, and because it had to be simultaneous. You see, people had to uh, in in ancient history had to. Uh, discover trade, they had to discover property rights, they had to then um, enjoy the specialization that made possible. And it's very hard to have any one of these without the other. And right, that, that process, I think, is is an incredibly important one that we know very, uh, unfortunately, very little about. Yeah, I um, that that interaction is very difficult to wrap your mind around it. You say we tell our students about it. I don't think we do a very good job um, because we don't have the analytical tools that we're so used to using elsewhere to apply to this kind of story. It's a dynamic story. There's this interaction. Of, it takes place over time. We have this interaction between exchange, the emergence of prices, and then the specialization. Those things are all chugging along together creating wealth and um I, you know i'm it's i'm barely i barely understand it and so i think it's um it's a it's a fertile area to both in in research i think and in exposition to make that clearer my colleague bart wilson and i have started about 2 years ago and we've been interested in seeing if we could create very uh, elementary experiments in the laboratory where people have to discover both specialization and exchange. Mm -hmm. So we don't give people any kind of rules to trade by. We don't even use the word trade. We don't talk about prices. We don't talk about any of those things. We just give them a chat room, a place where they can use... uh, words, and they can talk with each other um, through uh, this chat room by typing. But we we create uh, conditions which enable them to enormously increase, they can triple their earnings if they discover specialization and exchange. Now, this little world is one in which uh, each uh, decision period begins with a 10-second uh, interval in which 
they decide how much blue and how much red to produce. And we no guidelines. They can produce uh, any combination they want to. They uh, they want to consume these. We give them a payoff function, which in uh, uh, has the property that red and blue are complements. Okay, they need to consume red and blue in in a fixed proportion, and and this proportion varies is different for different. Uh, different subjects. Basically, the ma- they're different for even and for odd subjects, but they don't know this. They have to discover everything. And w- what they need to discover is that if one of them specializes in red and the other blue, and notice if they do that but don't trade, they make nothing because they have to consume these in fixed proportions. So, if they discover specialization and exchange, they can make three times as much uh, U.S. currency that we pay them as they can make if they just engage in home production. And and we look at economies of size two, four, and eight. And you know, it's just as exciting as the first experiments I did back in the 1950s. And what's really interesting about this world is some people are curious about their environment, they explore it, and they discover specialization and exchange, and some never do in the same, in the period of time that they have. Others discover it late, and by the end of the experiment, they're on the way to creating wealth. So we have three kinds of economies. We have economies that are, by the end of the experiment, are capturing 100% of the, of the possible wealth that they can, that can be created. We have some that are just finally figuring out autarky production, that is no trade, home Self, production. They're getting the balance right. Self-sufficiency. Yes, and we have some that have discovered it uh, a little late, and they're on the way. They're developing so we have uh, we we embrace the world here in the laboratory in terms of the, the rich, the poor, and and the ones that are uh, developing. And this is a great exercise because now in that world we can study property rights. Uh, we can give people we can have enforceable property rights or non-enforceable property rights. And we're going to be able to have a look at, in time, uh, innovation and change. And he, see, here's the case where not everyone gets to the equilibrium. To the maximum potential. No, not everyone gets there at all. But, but you see, they have to s- discover everything. And, and I think this is a world in which we're going to probably be able to uh, show that Wealth creation is not independent of the distribution of wealth. And, and the reason is that people that, the people that discover this do very well, uh, well for themselves, but they also do well for the economy. They, they help others along the way because they have yeah. to. Yeah, and of course the ordinary static equilibrium model doesn't have a, uh, I mean, distribution just falls out of it as a, uh, is as a uh, as a property. It's a byproduct. Uh, yeah, of the equilibrium, and 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 all of the welfare theorems are just pretty. Uh, there's just no dynamics in them. In them, there's no innovation or discovery. Uh, and and so, you know, if you give people different endowments, why they they can get to uh, an equilibrium, but there's within that world. You can't tell a story about uh, how in a, how wealth might be created dynamically, and how that might impact uh, or might be influenced by how wealth is distributed. So we're just opening that up, and it's too soon to say yet all the things we will learn. But it's pretty fascinating so far. Yeah, I, I find the um lack of dynamism in our uh, conventional models of 
markets to be very frustrating. Um, but th- that's a, a topic for an, uh, another day. Which economists have influenced you the most over your career? At the University of Kansas, this would have been about 1949, 50, 50, 51. Uh, one of my teachers there was Richard Howley. Uh, his, his field was the development of economic thought, and he was an incredible scholar. One of the things that I learned from him is that you, you, uh, you take a problem that you're interested in, and then what you do is learn all the things you need to know in order to, to really be good at that. So what did Dick Howey knew? No, he knew mathematics, French, Italian, uh, German. Uh, and he was a very thorough uh, and complete scholar in that in that field, and and th- that was a, a a model for me in many ways that I've applied in in all of my work. The in Harvard, I would say the person who influenced me me the most was Vasily Leontief, and partly that is because he. He had a certain amount of skepticism about economics and uh, a great sense of humor. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget, I was taking a theory class from from Leonieff, and, and he just spent a couple of weeks on utility theory and developing it uh, very extensively. And, and at the end of the two weeks, a student raised his hand and said, Professor Leonieff, what is utility good for? And Leonieff said, it's good for teaching. <laughs> <laughs> and now I thought that was, you see, he had these, these wisecracks that he would come up with that made you really think about, now, uh, what, we, we learn this stuff in economics. And then we tend to go out in the world, we become professors, and we teach what we learned. Yeah. But what is it good for? Now, I think it's important for people to constantly ask themselves that question. And and to – now, I, Russ, I know that you in teaching just love to use lots of examples that are, that are, that are alive – and and that people can relate to in their experience they can relate to these things and uh and of course in using experiments in teaching as well as real world examples i i i do my best to do the same the same thing and people need to i i think economics is it's very important that people be able to relate it to their personal experience uh, as agents, you know, out there, uh, out there in the world. So that was an important uh, influence on me. Well, I, I always, um, I always say the theory of the consumer, which utility theory is part of, is mainly good for exam questions, which is a variation on the Leontief line, and it's why I um, focus very highly on the what I think are the one or two useful things in consumer theory. And when I get to the theory of the firm, I don't teach uh, cost curves because although they are phenomenal for generating tricky exam questions, I, I don't think they tell us much about the real world uh, unless you're an engineer. And uh, most of my students are not engineers. They're economic students. So I, I, I couldn't agree more with that, um, with that, uh, that wording. Go ahead. So you're going to talk oh, about other yeah. influences. So I eventually became very much interested in, in Hayek's work. Now I was I was early exposed in the history of economic uh, thought way back there at the University of Kansas. I was exposed to uh, the ideas of the Austrian school, particularly uh, we read von Bavert, and uh, and in fact von Bavert has got some really nice. 
market examples uh, in his work in the theory of value. In fact, if you go back and read that, you you can almost see experiments there. He talks about a horse market. Hmm. The horse market with several buyers and one seller, and then he talks about the case where there's one buyer and one seller, and then several buyers and two sellers. He, he walks through a number of different cases with little tables that give you and he doesn't really have a uh, a full dynamic theory at all, but but it's it's an intuitive approach to it that I think is very helpful. Was was no doubt helpful to me, although I don't think I realized it, it was helpful to me in in uh, the first experiments uh, that, that I did. Now uh, I read. I don't know when I first read Hayek. I read his great 1945 paper on the uses of knowledge in society. I read that paper probably in the, in the 50s, and I was impressed by it, but, you know, I never understood it. Same with me. I never understood <laughs> Same that with paper. Me. And, uh, or appreciated and, and it. You, and moreover, you can't understand it by reading it once. <laughs> Uh, now, as I got into a career doing experimental economics, I would occasionally return to that paper, and I was able to, to better and better appreciate everything that he was talking about. And not, let me not say everything. I can still read that paper and benefit. I could do it tomorrow. Again, and I'd find things in it that I hadn't seen before. And then I uh, I went back and read his 1937 paper, which was the f- kind of the f- and I've forgotten the title of that. I think it's Economics and Knowledge, something like that, which was a precursor of the 1945 paper. Yeah, it is. I have I happen to just have it here on my desk. As it turns out, it is Economics and Knowledge. Yeah, and actually, I'm uh, Bruce Caldwell, who is a you know, quite a Hayek scholar, as you know. Yep. I understand from him that Hayek, these ideas actually started in the early 30s, and he's traced that. But that's a line of thinking that is just incredibly uh, innovative and uh, original. And I'm. Uh, it's been particularly useful to me because in these experiments, these experiments, institutions are information generating uh, devices. Uh, the, I mean, people are interacting through the rules of these uh, markets, and they are not only generating information, but they are incorporating that information into some sort of an adjustment of their behavior over time. And although Hayek was skeptical in e- of equilibrium, and I'm, well, so am I, of course. Uh, the idea that there's one price yeah. at, it, at a point in time that everything is exactly perfectly uh, equal to that price is unrealistic, of course. Of course. Things are moving all the time. But Nevertheless, I think it is a useful exercise to say, well, let's suppose things are not moving and and people have to. What's moving is the information that people have and they're learning as they go. And let's see if they can find uh, these equilibria. And, of course, after I discovered that they could find them quite easily, then I did experiments where the supply and demand were not stationary where the demand was growing or the supply and demand was shifting. And and what's interesting there is that these double auction markets track those changes in uh, equilibrium prices uh, uh, quite well. They may lag behind and they may overshoot sometimes when the, when they reverse, but they're, they're moving, uh, you know, always in the right uh, uh, direction. So high to me is... Uh, is an incredible uh, source of, of wisdom that I can actually uh, I can give you 
uh, most of the propositions that I find compelling and high, I can give you lots of experimental advantage, uh, examples of. And one of the problems that I think people have in reading Hayek is that it's not rich in examples. Nope. Now, of course, the great debates between socialism and capitalism, uh, that, that was a problem area that motivated, I think, a lot of his, uh, of his work. But there's just a huge amount of wisdom. Uh, you know, for example, Hayek has said that the proper study of social science is a study of that which is not. Hmm. I love that because in the laboratory, of course, we can study things that are not. What, is, what does that mean? Institutions. We can study trading rules that nobody's observed. <laughs> and and in fact, this can be a way of helping you to understand the power of the ones that have survived. Mm -hmm. You see, I think of institutions as rule systems as, as themselves having opportunity costs, and. Uh, and so we can, it's possible in the laboratory, you see, to, to, to study institutions that are artificial, that, and, uh, and we can f find out why it is their properties are inferior to some of the ones that have, have survived. And so I think, and I think experimentalists of the future, there's going to be more and more of this sort of thing uh, Well, I think done. what I was going to say about Hayek is that, that I find fascinating about your fascination with him is that the word markets uh, can mean so many things. We've talked about this in a, in a recent podcast. Um, a market can be like a farmer's market where – Literally, buyers and sellers congregate in one place, like the New York Stock Exchange, um, or at least virtually uh, congregate in one place. And yet what Hayek meant by markets was something quite amorphous and difficult to put your finger on. And I have a quote from you where you say, markets are about recognizing that information is dispersed in all social systems and that the problem of society is to find, devise, and discover institutions that incentivize and enable people to make the right decisions without anyone having to tell them what to do. And that's a very Hayekian quote, obviously. Yes, it is. That's, it's, it's, it's a variation on his 1945, except I'm talking about rule systems and institutions, but I think it applies very well there. And when you're talking about markets in that quote, and when Hayek was talking about markets, you're talking about this vast – seemingly chaotic but actually extraordinarily ordered aggregation of information that takes place when people exchange. And yet in your experiments, which Hayek has inspired, you're saying, you've got this very circumscribed field of stylized exchange, and yet you're learning things about what Hayek meant. And it just it's rather amazing. Yes. And I uh, – well, the, the more experiments I do and the more I read of Hayek, the more I appreciate both <laughs> and how uh, they, relevant they are to each other. Uh, well, let's talk about a variation of that issue of markets as information aggregators. You shared the Nobel Prize in 2002 with uh, Danny Kahneman, who was a pioneer of behavioral economics. And a lot of the work of the behavioral economics field – has challenged the standard economics idea that, that people are rational, uh, that people make logical decisions based on their preferences and their incentives. And experimental economics is interfaced with that field in, in dramatic and obvious ways. And yet I think I, – my guess is you don't come to the same conclusion. I know you've written about what you call ecological rationality, a different level of rationality. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how your work interfaces with that those behavioral uh, models and the conclusions that you draw from that work. I guess the first thing I should say, Russ, is that the that that literature is primarily concerned with individual decision making, and it's and it's an individuals that are isolated from from the kind of interactive world that you get in 
markets. And they're interested in the, much of that literature is interested in people's decision making under uncertainty, where uncertainty is represented by, uh, by probabilities and, and, uh, outcomes that are not, uh, that are not certain. And that literature that comes from the, from, uh, expected utility theory, uh, suggests that people are not very good expected utility, uh, uh, maximizers, not consistently, uh, so. And I think one of the important things that's missing there, though, is how it is that people react to uncertainty and discover ways of adapting uh, to uncertainty, uh, not as isolated individuals, but together through uh, rule-governed markets and social exchange systems. You know, we not only trade in markets, we trade favors with each other. We do things for each other. And that's a type of of market that we don't think of as a market. Uh, and I'm uh, there. There is a. By the way, there is a literature. Uh, it, it's mostly uh, Roy Radner and his co-authors uh, that have uh, investigated this. They call it the economics of survival. And. It's modeling, it's not modeling the individual as an expected utility maximizing uh, decision maker. It's modeling the firm, uh, the individual as desiring to survive and his heirs to, imagine a firm that wants to stay in business forever, okay, and is making investments under uncertainty. Is that equivalent to expected profit maximization? Turns out it's not. <laughs> uh, it turns that, out not. That, now, that's not intuitively obvious. Because but I assume it, the intuition there is that you don't – it's one thing to say I want to make as much as possible, but if there's a certain level you fall below for too long that you're out of the game, it's going to change your behavior. Is that the idea of it? Exactly. There is a basic theorem that says that there's a critical level of wealth – below which you will act as if you prefer risk. You, you will take a high-variance investment rather than a low that has the same return, and the intuition is simple. that you, If you don't, you're probably going to go broke anyway, but you've got a chance of getting out of this trap if you take the high-risk investment. And, and that's what a survivalist will do. And so if you do if you were to do experiments with a survivalist, you would say, "Oh, it's kind of odd. he's inconsistent for increases in uh for <clears throat> gambles that would increase his wealth, he's risk averse, but if in the loss domain, he's risk preferring." Well, but what the Roy Radner's work tells you is that that's a, that has to do with survival. It has nothing to do with our usual way of thinking of risk aversion and and uh, risk preference. So my point is simply that I think that there's a lot of empirical uh, anomalies in that decision-making literature, and it's not even clear to me we have the right model. Uh, and I, I would like to see, I think that work uh, needs to be enriched with some other ways of thinking about the problem. And in particular, I think it's important that it be integrated with how it is that people behave in kind of a socioeconomic system, which includes, which includes markets. And this, that's a big topic, Russ, the behavioral economics uh, uh, work. And we don't have time enough to do with it, uh, to do much with it here uh, as the hour winds down. But uh, I feel that a lot of that work is is really not linked up 
with the, the kind of uh, economic uh, traditions that humans have uh, developed that have uh, that have ended up uh, enabled them to create new forms of wealth through specialization and and markets. It's a it's it's a negative story. Seems to me the behavioral economic story is is tends to be a negative story that's difficult to ex- explain the enormous successes of the human career. And and actually, if you read, if you go to the Nobel site and look at the film where the the two people from the Nobel Foundation are interviewing Danny Kahneman and me. I think you'll get some interesting insights because uh, <clears throat> Danny is asked by the two interviewers uh, what he thinks about this. The, the, the thing that a lot of his research seemed to show that humans are are not very competent. <laughs> <laughs> well, Danny says yes, but that can't really be true because look how we've survived over the last billion years. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so Danny is really. You, you see, he's talking about. Certain uh, oh, kind of narrow interpretations of, of the economic model, which he's find, finding flawed, but it doesn't mean that he sees that as a, pro- a, a proper picture, uh, in the sense of representing uh, uh, what humans are and what we've become. And I don't think that research is going to be able to do that unless it's somehow linked up with exchange and specialization systems. Well, he's a psychologist by training, and in to many ways, that's an interesting way of distinguishing uh, psychology and economics. Psychology is about how our minds work um, and how we behave as individuals. Economics tries to be about how those decisions and behavior aggregate, as you say, in market settings, which are have properties that are, as Hayek like to say, quoting Adam Ferguson, they're the product of human design, but uh, they're the product of human action, but not of human design. And those institutions and rules that you've been talking about, no one individual understands them, probably. Uh, no one individual designed them, but they survive and created that competence that you're talking about, even though any one individual might not have it. Um, We are almost out of time. I'd I'd like you to speculate, if you could, about what areas of public policy that you think are most ripe for improvement, particularly using some of the insights that have come from the experiments you've run. We, We talked at a very basic level today about experiments confirming some of the insights of supply and demand or markets writ large. But you've done a lot of work on very, very spe- specialized kinds of markets, electricity and airplane, uh, airport landing slots. Uh, are those going to give us insights down the road for better public policy? Or are there other areas that you'd want to mention that you think we're going to get insights from the experimental literature? Well, I think that uh, markets have an important role to play and improving electric power systems, and I think that's been uh, proven in a lot of the foreign countries. It, it's not so obvious in this country because we've gotten hung up on uh, the kind of the transition from a regulated system to a liberalized one. So I, th- I think it was easier in a lot of the foreign markets simply because they weren't uh, they were government owned and the treasury was hurting <laughs> you know margaret thatcher sold privatization uh largely on the basis that it would improve the british treasury yeah lower taxes and, 
and you know the uh, and so that and you see the problem in the United States with electric power it was already privately owned okay but, but highly but, regulated but highly but regulated in the interest of uh, the utilities because that it's a regulation in which uh, the the risk of new investment uh, is borne by the consumers, not the the uh, firms, because they get a, a prudently incurred investment. You can recover your money by uh, by raising the price and, and through fiat, through government yes, law, yes. not through the marketplace. Yes, and that's very and that, and going from that world to a world which is a price responsive and and that it, and where firms bear more of the risk uh is extremely uh extremely difficult. But then, and I think there but there are other areas, you know, we deregulated the airlines, but it was the routes, it wasn't the airports. And airports can, now are becoming a major problem in terms of congestion. And there's no congestion pricing. Right. Used uh, to to uh, ration uh, the the scarce uh, airspace and landing uh, uh, rights in, in airports, and it's the same thing in our, of course, other public uh, automobile transportation system. And I think a, a third area, one that you didn't mention, is water water markets. Oh, and water is another type of network. Uh, electric power is an example of a network market. Uh, water um, networks of of supply and demand and distribution. I, I think that's an area where uh, co- good quality water and 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 is becoming scarcer, and people will have to go over to the to the more use of the of the self regulating properties that you get in markets. The Australians, by the way, are doing this, and we we've, we've uh, Australia has been very open to the use of markets and auctions and all kinds of areas of public policy. And uh, and I think they've uh, they, they've done well in in going in that direction. Well, the thing that worries me, I'd love to hear your reaction to this, is that what we call mark well, the word market again means many things. We talked about the farmers market, New York Stock Exchange. We talked about the Hayekian uh, chaos of reality that somehow becomes orderly through the specialization and truck barter and exchange that we're uh, we have the propensity for. But there's this third kind of thing we call markets where government uses incentives akin to markets of price and and supply and demand. Government uses incentives to steer resources the way that a Hayekian or farmer's market steers resources. And it seems that they often forget or can't discover some of the pieces that create the stability so the California experience with electric re- electricity de- so-called deregulation, where they created a so-called market, was actually a highly regulated, stylized use of incentives constructed by the government that failed miserably. Uh, so uh, do you think that the things that you can create in the lab can capture enough of the, of the complexity that, that we can base policy on it? Well, Russ, we're working on it, and uh, the California fiasco was, of course, really quite a disaster, and it's it's set back the liberalization movement in the United States very substantially, Uh, and it's, uh, if we, you know, we could learn a lot from some of the uh, improvements and liberalization has taken place in some foreign countries. Uh, but we still face a, a political problem in making that, that uh, transition. And, and the California episode, I think, is a beautiful example of how uh, 
of how flawed a a market design uh, can be, and people don't understand that that is that was the problem. So that what gets blamed is the whole idea of liberalizing that uh, uh, that sector of the economy. My guest today has been Vernon Smith, professor of economics and law at George Mason University. Thanks for joining us today, Vernon. Okay, Rush. Thank you. Bye-bye. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.